because they saw that all the cynicism and negativity and self-destructive stuff that was such a huge part of the punk scene was honestly just stupid and toxic and self-defeating. And everything that they did was kind of like a reaction to that. What's up everybody, I'm Finn McKenty. this is the Punk Rock NBA, and welcome back to another edition of Most Hated Artists. This, as you might guess from the title, is where I take a look at artists and bands that for whatever reason, people seem to really, really hate, and I look at exactly why. Because I think anytime people feel this strongly about an artist, there's something that we can learn from that from a marketing and consumer psychology perspective. In this episode, we're gonna look at three very, very different artists, Skrillex, Metallica, and of course, course, Justin Bieber, and see what we can learn. But before I get into that, first, I wanted to mention that I am now on Twitch. I'm streaming twice a week. I may increase that more in the future, but check it out at the link in the description. And also, I want to thank Trade for sponsoring this video. If you are a coffee fan, then you're going to want to check out Trade. They help you explore new coffees curated to your specific tastes and deliver them right to your door, shipped directly from local roasters. Step one is you take this quiz that they put together. You just answer questions about how you like your coffee and how you make it, and then Trade does their thing behind the scenes and curates the best matches for you. Step two, you choose your delivery frequency, and it will magically appear on your doorstep, delivered at peak freshness so you'll never run out again. And they ship everything in this compostable packaging which I think is really cool. And then lastly, step three, roast and repeat. Just rate your matches so Trade knows what you like and they can continue to fine tune that and keep sending you more coffees that you'll love. If you're into supporting local companies, this is a great way to do it because what you're getting is always super, super fresh. And best of all, Trade guarantees that you will love your first coffee. But if for whatever reason you don't, they will make it right and ship you a different bag for free. So if that sounds cool and you wanna check it out, my viewers will get their first bag free when they sign up. Just take my quiz by clicking on this link in the description. And as a special bonus, free shipping is also included. First up, let's talk about Skrillex, AKA Sonny Moore. And to understand why Skrillex was despised by so many people, first, I'll need you to step into my time machine here and set the dial for 2013. Time machine? I didn't know you had a time machine. This was the peak of the EDM boom, where the coolest thing you could do if you were a basic white person in your 20s was to go to one of those big festivals in places like Vegas or Miami, festivals like EDC, Ultra, Tomorrowland, all the other ones in Europe and stuff, and post about it on that cool new app you may have heard of called Instagram. And they called those music festivals, but really I think it was just kind of like one big party. You didn't go to those things primarily for the music like you would with say, Warp Tour or Summer Slaughter. You went to those festivals because you wanted to do drugs, party with other cool hot people, and brag about it on social media to all the people who were too poor and uncool to go. And I want you right now to just close your eyes and picture that scene in your head. A bunch of aggro frat dudes with their shirts off, flexing their eight packs, partying at some club in Vegas with their female counterparts. And when you think of what is the soundtrack to that scene, probably it would be dubstep. And the face of dubstep at that time at least was one person, Sonny Moore, AKA Skrillex. He was by far the biggest name in what people called bro step, which was kind of like that new American version of dubstep. He was playing to tens of thousands of people every night who were just going absolutely ape shit, like losing their shit. And I don't know, he's probably making millions of dollars a show. For a couple of years there, he was one of the biggest stars in music. He was right up there with like Taylor Swift, which to be honest is exactly why I think he was so hated. But it's a little bit more complicated than that because he was getting hate from several different directions for related but different reasons. It's like, imagine Imagine you're playing GTA or something and all the factions hate you. That's what it was like to be Skrillex in 2013. On the one hand, you had your usual gatekeepy rock fans, who I think sort of had two reasons to hate him. First of all, there was the relatively small but still significant number of people who knew him as Sonny Moore from, from first to last. As most of you guys probably know, this was his band before he was Skrillex. I would say that they were one of the pioneers of what you could call like the mall screamo sound, although they were, let's just say, very similar to Seosin, who as far as I'm concerned kind of created that sound, but that's a whole other discussion. Regardless of that, they were fixtures in that scene. Note to Self was one of the anthems for like angsty suburban teenage kids that wore those 
stripey fingerless gloves, dyed their hair black and got mad because their mom wouldn't take him to Hot Topic to buy a new Invader Zim shirt. And as I've talked about many times, it's just sort of a natural dynamic that whatever kind of music is popular at the moment with those angsty suburban teenagers, the rock and metal gatekeepers tend to hate that stuff. So that was part of it. And I think another chunk of the hate came from what they call tall poppy syndrome, which is a term that basically refers to the idea of if one flower grows a little bit taller than the other ones, you should probably just go ahead and cut that flower's head off because who does it think it is? So I think for some chunk of people in the scene, they saw him go from Sonny Moore, the singer of From First to Last, who were certainly a successful band, but they weren't huge. They weren't like Fall Out Boy or Paramore or anything like that. And then just a couple years later, the same same guy becomes Skrillex, just blows the fuck up and leaves the entire genre of rock in the dust. And I think that's the part that really stung for a lot of people. It was bad enough that the guy from the quote unquote gay emo band was popular now, but what made it even worse is that he turned his back on guitar music. And as always, there was a little bit of jealousy there. You would hear a lot of people say back then that DJs were the new rock stars, which I think was accurate. And guess who didn't like that very much? That's right, dudes in rock bands. But it wasn't just just them. The people in the electronic music scene hated him too, although for a completely different reason. There's a great video called All My Friends Hate Skrillex that goes into like exhausting detail about all this and talks about like the dubstep scene and all that. I would recommend it if you want to really like exhaustive history of that, but basically it boils down to this. The kind of music that Skrillex played was referred to as dubstep at the time, but as the dubstep purists will I'm sure point out in the comments of this video, the kind of stuff Skrillex was doing wasn't really dubstep per se, whereas real dubstep sounds a little bit more like this. A stone will be thrown at the state and a stone will be thrown at the churches. And although the real dubstep nerds are absolutely insufferable, they kind of had a point. They weren't wrong. In the sense that he really did lead to dubstep being redefined as that like American wobble wobble kind of sound. <laughs> And the bro step scene did bring in this whole new contingent of people into the scene, a lot of which were genuinely very annoying douchey kind of people. The word bro step was originally coined by DJ Cozzy around 2010 and was subsequently popularized by a spin profile of the movement in 2011. It's an inherently pejorative term designed to disparage the people who listen to this type of dubstep as bros. And to be clear, I'm sure that he didn't intend for any of that to happen, but it is true that that sort of happened in the wake of his success. But to that, I would say, is that really his fault? Like, do you really think that he wanted or intended for that to happen? Is it his fault that the music he made was more appealing to a mainstream audience than the stuff that Burial or whatever was doing? I don't think it is. And more to the point, how did he hurt the scene? Other than maybe bruising their ego by becoming so successful. I mean, his success didn't make the underground dubstep scene disappear, right? If anything, I would kind of compare him to what's happening with MGK right now. Yes, a lot of the people coming in may not necessarily understand the genre and the roots and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, him bringing more attention to dubstep and electronic music in general could only be a good thing for the scene. And I have to think that his success led to a lot of people getting into quote unquote real dubstep. I mean, think about it, with tens of millions of people listening to his music, if only like one half of 1% of them ended up getting into underground electronic music, that's a lot of people. So what I think you have here is a classic case of people projecting their opinions of an overall genre and its fan base onto specific artists. People saw these EDM festivals full of frat dudes and they saw how everybody was all of a sudden a quote unquote DJ. And I put that in quotes because there were a lot of people who just pressed play and stood in the DJ booth fist pumping and pretending to push buttons on their controllers without actually DJing at all. And so it's understandable to me that that stuff left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. It was kind of an annoying scene with a lot of bullshit around it. But to think that Skrillex was one of those people, one of those like fake DJ talentless clout chasers is just bizarre to me. And actually, it's kind of strange to me that Skrillex was ever seen as cool by like normies. I mean, I don't know him at all. I've never met him. But when I think of him, I see this like 
kind of weird looking, awkward, nerdy guy who wears youth large Burzum shirts. Not exactly the kind of guy that you would expect frat dudes and sorority girls to worship, but that happened. 2013 was weird like that. So to me, the overall lesson here is take everybody as an individual. Don't project your feelings about a genre and its fan base onto individual artists or anyone else. Because remember, artists don't choose their fans. And the truth is that nine times out of 10, they probably think that their fans are just as annoying and douchey as you do. And next up, the kings of thrash, Metallica. And you might be saying to yourself, wait, Metallica is hated? Are you crazy? They're like hands down the most successful metal band of all time. One of the most popular, best-selling bands in all of rock. Like you're crazy. Everybody loves Metallica. And all of those things are true, especially in 2021 when the band is kind of in the legacy phase of their career where they obviously have nothing left to prove, but it definitely hasn't always been that way. In fact, there's been several points in their career where it was the exact opposite, where everyone absolutely hated Metallica. There was the time that they cut their hair and were accused of selling out and going grunge. There was the whole Saint Anger snare thing. And with that, normally I would say that's metal nerds just blowing something out of proportion because I mean, come on, it's a snare drum. How bad could it possibly be? But uh, in this case, no, it actually was that bad. And this is coming from somebody who loves those like ringy trash can snares and slam and hardcore. The Saint Anger snare is a whole other beast. And believe it or not, people even hated the Black Album when it came out back in 91. That album is now rightly considered an all time classic. But when it came out, that's right, you guessed it, all their old school fans hated it because it wasn't Injustice for All Part Two. And then there was some kind of monster. This was their documentary that came out and kind of made them all look like bunch of clueless old rich dudes acting like dramatic middle school kids he fucking left the band hello <laughs> do you know what i mean he fucking left the band but the moment that i wanted to talk about was their lawsuit against napster which happened back in 2000 and made them just absolutely despised by everybody way outside the metal scene like everybody hated metallica at the time but in hindsight i actually think that they were right everything they said was true and just to rewind a little bit this was 20 years ago and i just kind of had the horrifying realization that a lot of people watching this are probably too young to have actually used or experienced napster when it came out which is terrifying but essentially napster was the original application for file sharing, AKA piracy. Before Torrance and LimeWire and Kazaa and all that, there was Napster. They laid the foundation for all of that. And so back in 1999, one day Metallica's manager called him and said, hey guys, uh, I just heard I Disappear on the radio, which was a problem because this song wasn't out yet. It was supposed to be on the soundtrack for Mission Impossible 2, and yet somehow it was on the radio. So they did some research and found out that it had gotten leaked on Napster. They were pissed, they sued Napster, and they had 300,000 users who had downloaded the song banned from Napster. To a lot of people, they just came off as these like entitled rich guys raining on the parade, trying to ruin this cool new thing that was enabling so many people to get all this new music. Tons of bands were going at them. They even ended up getting mocked on South Park for it. This is the home of Lars Ulrich, the drummer from Metallica. This month he was hoping to have a gold-plated Shark Tank bar installed right next to the pool. But thanks to people downloading his music for free, he must now wait a few months before he can afford it. It was not a good look. But here's the thing that nobody wants to talk about. Metallica was right. Piracy did decimate the music industry. Everything that Lars said he was afraid of ended up happening. If you look at the chart here, you can see that in less than a decade, piracy cut overall music industry revenue by half. And just imagine if you had to take a 50% pay cut, you'd probably be pissed too. That might not be such a problem for people like Metallica who are already rich, but for all the vast majority of artists who are like kind of just getting by, that sucked. And as much as everyone loves to dunk on the guy, Lars did kind of see the future because his point here wasn't necessarily let's shut down Napster. If you read it, what he was actually saying was more like, all right, this downloading thing is kind of cool. I can see the potential here, but we've got to find a way for artists to get compensated for their work or it's going to kill the music industry. So if we are going to sell our music on the internet in whatever way we so choose, we cannot do that if the guy next door 
is giving it away for free. Which, like I said, it actually was until Spotify came along and figured this all out. Again, if you look at the chart, you can see that music industry revenue is at its highest point that it's been in like 15 years with almost all of that growth coming from streaming. So what's the lesson here? To me, it's pretty simple. When it comes to business, at least, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Somebody's always gotta pay. I mean, we all loved downloading music, right? I certainly pirated tons of shit, but it wasn't really free. Somebody had to pay for it. And in this case, that was the artist. And Lars may be an obnoxious off-putting windbag, but he wasn't wrong. And last, but definitely not least, Justin Bieber. I never thought that I would say this, but he is actually somebody who I've grown to really admire in the past few years. But he certainly wasn't always that person for me or really anybody else other than 11-year-old believers. I just got two new tattoos. Um, I love you, believers. If you were on the internet back in 2010, you'll remember what I'm talking about. He was probably like literally the most hated person on the planet for a solid three or four years. Some of that was your usual metal snobs and gatekeepers and all those other people who just hate whatever's popular. And you know that some of those people never gave up. They're still posting those cringy Justin Bieber memes on Facebook like they never left 2011. But not all of that hate was misguided because the honest truth is that he was kind of a shithead. He actually said so himself recently. A lot a lot of the douchey things I was doing gave people the right to be like, man, that's freaking douchey, bro. I started really feeling myself too much. People love me. I'm the shit. That's honestly what I thought. I got very arrogant and cocky. I was wearing sunglasses inside. I feel like that's the ultimate hallmark of somebody who's feeling themselves a little bit too much when they wear sunglasses inside. And as just a few examples of what he's talking about, there was the time he went to the Anne Frank Museum and wrote in the guest book, Anne was a great girl. Hopefully she would have been a believer. And there was the time where he bought a black market pet monkey on a whim and it got confiscated in Germany. Buying exotic pets is always a sign that a celebrity is about to go off the rails. And quite a few other things. I think they like found drugs on his tour bus once or something. But my personal favorite was the time that he was caught on video peeing in a mop bucket at a hotel. And then for whatever reason, he just randomly says, fuck Bill Clinton. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Like he said himself, he became an obnoxious, out of control douchebag and gave people a lot of very valid reasons to hate him. And as somebody who was also an obnoxious douchebag at one point in my life, what I appreciate so much about him is that he changed. He didn't stay that person. And I'm glad that I didn't either. I'm not sure if there was some sort of like big intervention behind the scenes or what, but I started to see this change in 2015. I think the first big pivotal moment was when Comedy Central did that roast of Justin Bieber, which by the way, if you haven't watched, is actually pretty great. Seems like only yesterday you were discovered on YouTube. Time flies when you're a piece of shit. And at the end, he does this little monologue where he pretty much says, I've been an asshole, I'm sorry, and I want to change. Before I go, I want to thank everyone for tonight. This roast was a dream of mine. I turned a lot of people off over the past few years, but I know I can still turn out good music and turn everything all around. And I feel like the collective reaction to that was kind of like, okay, that was cool. Maybe Justin Bieber's not so bad after all. And then later that year, he came out with his album Purpose. And I think everyone was like, wait a minute, hold up. This album is actually really fucking good. And also, why does he look like he's been trapped under ice all of a sudden? I'm sure he still has his haters, but I feel like that's the moment where it really flipped for him and people kind of started to give him the benefit of the doubt because they could tell that it was genuine. He really, truly did want to be a better and different person. And since then, he's become one of my personal favorite people in mainstream pop culture who's honestly kind of inspiring he seems like a good dude he's pretty much done like a complete 180 he went from being that obnoxious douchebag party kid to now putting everything he's got into getting off drugs and being a good husband he's become this like super g-rated church going married guy and it's honestly really cool to see and that's something that really resonates with me because that's pretty much the exact same transition I went through back in like 2013. Apologies to anybody who knew me 10 or 12 years ago, by the way, when I was still an obnoxious douchebag. I'm very deeply ashamed of a lot of things I said and done back then. So please accept my apologies if you're one of those people. What I really appreciate most about him is, I'm not really sure exactly how to put this, but he just seems like the least cynical person on earth right now. And I find that very refreshing. I love it. Like, listen to how he talks about his wife. I'm freaking married now. I got the best wife in the world. She supports me through so much. I'm really honored to be her husband. And I just, yes. Who else in Hollywood is willing to be that just like 
vulnerable and honest and sincere and just completely let down any pretense of trying to impress anybody with how cool they are and how much they have their shit together. And if you look at his Instagram, like most of it is these like very G-rated pictures of him like just hanging out with Haley at their house, watching him basketball and stuff, mixed in with these like wine mom type inspirational quotes. And I'm sure to a lot of people, this is like really corny, but to me, it's just refreshing. I think it's fucking cool that he's so like aggressively sincere because honestly, I'm just exhausted by all the cynicism and snarkiness and sarcasm and all this other stuff that's such a huge part of the alternative music world and pop culture in general. And to be clear, I totally recognize that I am part of that. I fall into that too, just like anybody else. And that's why I appreciate that there's people like him out there that kind of remind you, like, you don't have to be that way. It's okay to be sincere. It's not always a contest of like, who can say the coolest, snarkiest, most cynical thing. It probably sounds weird to say, and I mean, it feels weird to say it, but what he is doing actually reminds me a lot of bands like Youth of Today and Gorilla Biscuits that I discovered in high school and just really resonated with me and changed the way that I see everything. Because they saw that all the cynicism and negativity and self-destructive stuff that was such a huge part of the punk scene was honestly just stupid and toxic and self-defeating. And everything that they did was kind of like a reaction to that. They took this like aggressive stance on promoting positivity and self-improvement. And you'd think that people would celebrate them for that, right? Because, I mean, why wouldn't you? That's a great message. But no, it was the exact opposite. People hated them for it. People said they were corny, that they didn't belong in the scene, blah, blah, blah. All the stuff that you can imagine cynical people like Fat Mike saying about people that called bullshit on his negative self-destructive lifestyle. I think it's cool that he talks about getting off drugs and how unhealthy that is. But what I really like about him is the example that he sets for young men with marriage. Because getting married now is not really that cool. Very very, very few people in Hollywood talk about marriage the way that he does. It's something to like take seriously and put consistent daily effort into. And that really hit home to me because I had that same kind of moment. You know, there was a point in my life where I thought that I was just doomed to either be forever alone or in a string of like shitty dysfunctional relationships for the rest of my life. Just like my mom, she was married four times. So I didn't exactly have a template for like happy, healthy marriages. And I had just kind of given up on that idea altogether, partly because that's what the media tells us, right? The media is full of messages telling you that marriage sucks and everyone's miserable and you're gonna fight all the time. And so I just kind of accepted that. But when I met my wife, honestly, it gave me hope again. I had that same kind of moment that he did. I kind of slapped myself in the face and I said, okay, this is it. You cannot fuck this one up. So far I haven't, let's hope it stays that way. So anyway, all of this is to say that yes, Justin Bieber was definitely an insufferable shithead at one point. But what I really deeply respect is that he had the courage to admit that to himself and to the world and to publicly commit to being better. He had the courage to confront it and deal with it and try to be better. Even though he had all the money and fame in the world, he certainly didn't have to do that. He could have chosen the path of least resistance, just kept being that guy, but he didn't. He chose what was right. And that is something I think you have to respect. You have my word, I will not end up broken, pathetic, bitter, or sitting on the dais of somebody else's roast. <laughs> All right, my friends, that does it for this episode of Most Hated Bands. Before I let you go, I wanted to mention my new merch, such as this 2005 inspired generic hardcore shirt, complete with generic hardcore lyrics on the back and the mosh girl. Also check me out on Twitch if you haven't. There's a link to both of those things in the description. And as always, I wanna thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. It is because of your support that I'm able to do a lot of things. Patrons get every podcast a week early. There's a patron only channel on my Discord that I'm super active in. I do Q and A's, do some giveaways. There's a way to have me review your music or artwork or anything else you wanna get my eyes and ears on. I do those every couple weeks on Twitch and then post them on Patreon as well. So if that sounds cool to you, check that out at the link in the description. And with that, I'm gonna sign off for now, but I will see you next time.